So I've actually got an eye beacon attached to my cat. Ruby is alive. Ruby's not going in. Oh, I want to dream for developer happiness. So, hey, how's everyone going? Nice? All right, we have a lot of people in here. So before I start like talking a lot and moving on the stage, pretending that I know something about Ruby, uh, can I take a picture of all of us? Because it's really awesome. Like I have been talking a lot in a lot of different conferences and I al always try to take pictures of the people that are like, like just like being here, like hearing me and pretending that they like me, all right? <laughs> Let's do then. So hey, smile. Okay. Nice. All right. So let's see if I can start it here. All right. So I'm talking about APIs. Uh, APIs are awesome. So APIs, I don't know if you stop to thinking about APIs like every now and then, but APIs is what makes the web what it is today. Uh, so, all right, it's not working. So it's what makes uh, the web what is it today. So APIs have been pushing us forward into like changing the ways that machines communicate to each other. And not exactly how they communicate with each other, but also this whole new mobile thing and like how it's also be pushing for uh, APIs and how we do it, how we develop it. So now every application that you have been building right now, even the smallest ones, they have an API. Maybe to users, maybe to some kind of articles or whatever, uh, or to some web application, because right now we have a bunch of JavaScript frameworks that you can build like single page apps. So yeah, we have been doing this, and we as developers uh, are not really concerned about some quality. So, <laughs> all right, so this is funny. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we are developer are not really, is not, are not really concerned about our APIs, about how good they are, and we are not like investing a uh, great amount of time on building it and being concerned about it. But we have a lot of great open source software out there that help us into building APIs. And that's what I would like to talk a little bit more about this talk. So my name is Juan Moura. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at RIDE. I'll talk a little bit about RIDE and other stuff uh, later in the conference. But this is how far I have traveled just to talk about APIs to you. Yeah. It was a 16 hours flight. Uh, I was really tired yesterday. I still have a little bit of troubles with my throat. I think it's about the weather, but it's an amazing city. So I have been in Rizal before. I spoke here uh, in 2013. It was awesome, really great city, awesome people. And I came all this way to talk to you about uh, building APIs like there's a easy tomorrow because when you're talking about quality, when I talk about API quality, uh, we need to think about how we're going to sustain this quality over time and how we're going to develop uh, good APIs using Rails. Uh, so this is not my first time giving this talk. Uh, I have been in Rails, Rails Conf uh, early this year. It was really great, awesome. I gave this talk there as well and also in RubyConf Sao Paulo. And uh, I would like to share a little bit about the experience on Rails Conf. So RailsConf this year was in Atlanta. Uh, have anyone been to Atlanta before? Awesome. So Atlanta is an awesome city. It's like a big country city. They have a bunch of buildings, a bunch of cars. Uh, it feels like home to me. Uh, and it was a great experience. There was a lot of people like playing ping pong. They had beer. So yeah, it was awesome. We had like Kent back speaking, and it was a great, really a great, a great uh, experience overall. And back there, I s always when I traveling and going to the conference, uh, speaking or as an attendee, I usually tell people that I'm from Brazil. And when I tell them from Brazil, it's really funny because people just start to asking me. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, all right. 
So this is really funny because every time I, not really funny because every time I say that I'm from Brazil, people usually ask me, oh, but what about all these trees and lakes and flowers that you have back there? It must be an awesome place to live, right? And I say, yeah, well, not that much. Uh, that's actually the city that I came from. There's not that many trees and not that many lakes, but it's an awesome city and really a big one. So this is Sao Paulo, and it's actually the largest city in the whole Americas. And not only it, but also the largest city and the most populous one in the whole Southern Hemisphere. So yeah, it's a really big city, so we don't have trees, animals, and stuff, but we have a lot of traffic. <laughs> this is funny, this is some like usual Friday night, you can easily be caught in one of those. And when I showed this on, on RailsConf, it was funny because someone pointed out that even the motorcycles have a jam. <laughs> like, the whole point of buying a motorcycle is to move fast and not to be caught in one of those. But there's one thing that we uh, in Brazil really know how to do it, and we do pretty well. We know how to have fun. Like, we really know how to have fun, and one of the major things that make us, like, be together and drink and have fun is soccer. How many of you like soccer? Nice, nice, really great. So, yeah, soccer is awesome. We love it back there. Everyone tries, at least, to play it, and everyone supports a team. So that's why I decided to join the startup back on the World Cup, the last World Cup. Uh, it was called Palpiteo, so they invited me to join them as their CTO, and I was really excited about it. It was a great opportunity. I liked soccer, and I said, all right, let's do it. We were basically building a, social, a soccer social network. So this was really fun, and I decided to join them, and it was like two weeks away from the World Cup. So we were expecting a lot of traffic. We had a bunch of marketing stuff going on. So we had some deals with TV cables to do like some like uh, commercials and stuff. Uh, we also had filmed the commercial with Neymar. So we we're saying, all right, it's gonna be awesome. And then I decided to do some uh, stress testing. I said, all right, so we're expecting this, like a lot of requests and a lot of people going in, but we don't know if we can handle that. So I decided to do some stress testing on, on, on our API, and that's the result that I got. Uh, so one of our APIs was taking nine seconds. So how could we deal with a lot of requests with an endpoint that has taken like nine seconds to load? It was way too much. Uh, and then I decided to take a deeper look to see, all right, so we have like probably one week and a, one week and a half to the World Cup, uh, where's the bottleneck here? Like, where's the problem? How can I solve it? And uh, this was my face because I discovered that we had a lot of problems actually. So we had no background job, uh, we had like wrong relationships, we had like bad architecture in general, uh, no indexes, so all indexes are missing in the database. Uh, there was no cache at all, and there, there, like, there was a lot of troubles in the application in general. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about all these problems and how I solve it. If you want to know more about it, I talked on RubyConf last year about it, so you can check it on this link. Uh, I'll share this presentation later, so whatever. Uh, but the thing is, when I saw it, uh, I was like, all right, so what is happening, like I, I didn't know how to solve it. I, I started looking into our code and the gems that we are using and all right, so I need to find a way to fix it. And that was uh, a nice spot to be because that's when I fall in love. And I fall in love with a gem uh, that is called Rails API. So back then we were using the Rails API and we were using specifically Activa Mother Serializer. Um, so how many of you have been using Activa Mother Serializer? Nice, really nice. Um, so that time I decided to use Activa Mother Serializer and I had a bunch of performance stuff to solve and it really helped me out to sort these things out. I'm gonna talk a little bit over it uh, on, the next, on the next slides. But since I used it, I, I didn't stop to use it there. So I also love to build new things. Uh, I have been building it and using Activa Mother Serializer over and over again. So uh, for example, I wanted to do, I love podcasts, but I didn't have an app on Android to listen it. So I built an app to listen it uh, and use Activa Mother Serializer for the API. And then I decided that I want to do something with soccer again. So I built a bot that send like soccer news on your, on your phone, on 
your WhatsApp groups. Uh, and the, the, the great thing about all these products and the problem that we had on Palpitators is that there's one thing that ruled them all, and this thing is an API. And what is fun about APIs is, I don't know if you know what the acronym mean, but it actually means Application Programming Interface. And interface is the key word here. So when we're talking about interface, we are always concerned about uh, mobile interface, user interface, user experience in general. And we, we, like, we put so much attention on it that we like, forgot about APIs. And APIs are really a great asset. Actually, an API can make a lot of difference into your business. It can really push your business like, to have a successful business or not. So there are some examples uh, how APIs can be one of the greatest assets that our company has. Uh, a great example is the login with Facebook. So for you that for you that for those that don't realize it, like this is an API, like it's a simple API that have been pushing forward so much that right now, even if you're thinking about de developing like a simple app you will have to integrate with Facebook, and you're gonna use like login with Facebook. So it's a simple API that have been pushing their, their business forward. So it can be one of their great assets, but it also can be one of your great liabilities. Uh, not only because uh, of a lot of security stuff, but also because performance, and also because it's another pain point that you're gonna need to check and you're gonna need to work on. So if you do not concern, and if you do not invest enough time to build a good API, it will definitely, definitely hunt you back later. But uh, here we have another problem, right? So what is a good API? So when we say, all right, we need to build good APIs, uh, I got it, every product nowadays have APIs, APIs can be a great asset, but how do I build, like what is a good API? So there is this great talk, um, there was this great talk uh, that Joshua Blanche gave on Google, and uh, I like to code it because I think it's really simple, and like this is the really simple way to define a good API, is that one API should do one thing and do it really well. Uh, and I, I usually like this code, and it, it really makes like, it, when you have some hard decisions to make about APIs, this, this code can help in you to figure this out. But I need a more clear definition of what is a good API. So after like searching a little bit, I got in this definition that a good API have uh, seven or eight, eight, have eight points uh, that define if an API is good or bad. And those eight points are performance, scalability, reusability, evolvability, documentation, it must be easy to learn, it must be easy to use, and most importantly, it must be hard to misuse. So these are the eight points that I find out that are that are what define if an API is good or is bad. And based on these eight points, I would like to talk a bit why Rails is the best tool to develop a good API. And the only problem about this is that it's not. <laughs> yeah, we know about it. But there's a good thing. So it's a great one because if you check those eight points that I mentioned before, so all these points, performance, reusability, usability, read to use, documentation, whatever, all those points have one thing in common. They are deeply related to conventions. And because if you follow conventions, it's probably gonna be easy to use, it's probably gonna be easy to learn, easy to document, easy to reuse, and whatever. And conventions are deeply related to Rails, so yeah. Rails is, uh, end up being a, a, really, a really great tool by definition, but the problem is that Rails is robust as <coughs> So yeah, it's a lot we need to do. So Rails is just big, this big thing that you don't need it when you're building a simple API. So how do you use Rails and all this great stuff, and then co great conventions that they have in order to build uh, great APIs, but without concerning about how robust it is? So that's when Rails APIs comes in. Uh, who have already heard about Rails API before? Nice, yeah. So Rails APIs is basically a subset of a Rails application. It's a gem that you install, it removes all the crap that you don't need when building an API, and add a few stuff that you're gonna find really helpful when building an API. It's really simple, really straightforward. Uh, it's a node project, a lot of people have been using it. 
um, and it's really cool. So I would like to give some examples about, um, about Rails API. And if you have heard about it, Rails API is getting merged into Rails 5, what is awesome. So I'm one of the contributors and now the maintainer of Rails API and Activia Model Serializer, and we are really excited about it. And I was actually like really, uh, ha really happy to be part of it because Back in February, I opened this pull request that was to implement a feature that I'm going to talk about later in Activa Model Serializer that's part of Rails API. And was on this pull request that uh, Guillermo commented, like, I just want to say if it's done, it's going to be merged into Rails 5 and whatever. And it was awesome. Like, uh, I really love about it because I was being part of it and I was watching it. And then finally, the pull request came on. And there was a great discussion in there if you want to go in and see some flame wars going on. But it was really nice and Rails API got merged into Rails and now we are trying to figure this out, how this is gonna work and we have a lot to do until Rails 5 release. Uh, but basically, uh, if you don't know Rails API or if you don't never check deeply into it, Rails API is divided in two things. Uh, one of them is the core that basically is the water removes everything that you don't need from the Rails app and the Activa model serializer part that it's basically a new layer that will convert your models, your, your Ruby objects into JSON objects. I will explain a little bit of how it works. Um, but the cool thing is that we are deeply related to Rails itself because our main goal is to bring conventions to your JSON generation. What, end up, what ends up to be exactly the same phrase that Rails has in, in its website. So it makes a lot of sense to be together. Uh, so I will give a little example of how Activa Model Serializer works so that you're not like hanging if you never use it. So imagine that you have a post object, right? So you have a usual post model, and this post model have some attributes and relationships. So in this case, it has a title that is a string, a body that is a text, a publish date that is a date, a text that's a reference, a relationship, whatever, and a comments that is the same thing. So basically, uh, you have this inside your Rails context, and what you want is an API that converts this to JSON but you want to like change it a little bit. You probably don't want all the attributes in the response. You want probably to create some virtual attributes. Meanwhile, like you want to serve some virtual attributes that don't exist. So you want to have actual control on this JSON generation thing. So using Activa Model Serializer and Rails API, your controller will remain the same thing. So if you check your controller, it will mostly look to what you have today. So you're gonna find all posts and then you're gonna render, then you're gonna render uh, this post as a JSON. But the good thing is that you're not gonna have views or whatever, you're gonna have a serializer file that it's some, like you could compare it as a view because every controller is gonna have one, uh, but not ever, uh, not ever action. But this is how a serializer will looks like. Uh, I will go over, with, go over it like line by line in order to make it easier. So the first line is pretty straightforward. We're just declaring a new class. There's a post serializer. Uh, the second line is defining the attributes that you want to convert. So you're gonna see that you're gonna have the title attribute that we see before. There's a string, the body one that is a text. We are creating a new attribute that it's comments count. The post doesn't have this attribute. It's a virtual one. And we are not using any other attribute that we had. Uh, so this is how we create virtual attributes. So let's say that I want to show how many comments we have uh, on every post. So I can just like, all right, so I will create this method comments count that gets all comments and size how many and count how many I want I have. And this is gonna be the end result. So you're gonna have like a simple API with all the attributes that you want, even if you want virtual ones. Here in this case, we don't have relationships, but we could have relationships. We could have virtual relationships and whatever. Uh, we are gonna go over to it uh, in, in a little while. So first we had AMS uh, 08. So this is the version that I use in Palpiteros that helped me to figure out all those performance issues back then. Uh, but then they released the 09 version. Uh, how many of you have used the 1808 version? All right, the 09? All right, how many of you have heard about the 010 version? Nice. 
So basically, the OTEN version is the new version of Activio Model Serializer. We have been working on it for almost a year, maybe, and we're really like uh, glad with the feedback that we are receiving and also uh, how, it's, how it's evolving really fast. So basically, this new version is what pushed forward the AMES to join Rails because it has some new features that we needed in order to be merged and in order to be more useful. Uh, I want to go over like five of these issues that might help you when developing APIs. So uh, five of these features. So first of these features is adapter pattern. So basically, we implemented an adapter pattern that enables you to change uh, the whole, uh, how can I say that, uh, the whole, uh, uh, I forgot the word in English. So for example, if you want to serve a JSON application, a JSON API, you can do it. If you want to convert all your APIs to XML, you can change it one line of code. So basically, it enables you, like, the way you want to convert your attributes is staying the same, just what changes the output. So you can change it to JSON, XML, ADON, RDF, whatever. So you can easily, like, build your own adapters and integrate it with Active Model Serializer. We were going to deliver some, like, pre-built ones, pre-built adapters, so JSON for sure, and also a JSON API one. And this is actually the second feature that I want to talk about. How many of you have heard about JSON API? Awesome. So some people that I consider like the most smart people I have ever met, Steve Klabnik and Yehuda, are the ones that are like behind it, but there's other people that are involved with it. There's Glab and other people that are really famous and really know what they're doing. Uh, they're building a convention for building JSON APIs. It's basically like, it, and it comes with everything that conventions have. So you don't have to go over how the things are going to be built. You don't have to negotiate with clients, with your mobile clients or with your web clients, uh, how it's going to be the conventions and how it's going to be the format. Everything is predefined. So you have a lot of like good points there. You have a, a great like uh, start ahead when like programming field for programming things and planning how your API is gonna work. And JSON API has released the 1.0 version and this is really fun because we are supporting Rails API from the scratch. So for example, if you have your API using Activo Serializer, you, you want it to follow the JSON API conventions, all you have to do is change one line of code and it's gonna follow all the conventions. And this is really cool because it's not just Rails that are going forward for JSON API. We have a lot of JavaScript clients that are going as well. So for example, Ember.js. Ember.js now has a JSON API adapter. So it basically means that you can plug your Ember.js with your Rails like out of the box, really. So there's like really easy and they just understand each other. Uh, this is actually all you need to do in order to make our API to respond to JSON API conventions. And this is really cool because you can have all the benefits that the conventions have, all the upsides uh, with just one line of code. So the third feature that I want to talk about, it's really, really cool. I really like it, mostly because I have a personal relationship with it because that's one of the things that saved me back then with the performance issues uh, is cache. So in older versions of Active Model Serializer, we had cache, but this time is a brand new implementation. So how it works, imagine that you have your API, so you have your post API as we showed before, and uh, you want to cache it. So you have done a lot of optimizations already, and now you want to cache the endpoints. All you need to do is go to your Serializer and type cache on it, and it's done you're gonna cache all in the points that use those, those realizer. So the index endpoint, the show endpoint, whatever, ever endpoints that res responds with the post serializer, it's gonna be cached. And you can even like use your own key in case you want to like do some crazy logic to like deactivate this cache or whatever. Uh, so you can use your own key and you can use all the actually, uh, all the cache methods from the rails. So you can use Xparzin and any other method that you want. We're basically doing uh, um, another layer before the rails cache. So you can use all the same, the same options that you'd have. And this is really fun because this, this is how it works and that's a great performance, that, great performance improvement that we have done. So basically, imagine that you have a controller and you have 
All right. The, basically, imagine that you have a controller and you have two different, two different uh, actions. So your index action basically render all the posts. So all the posts are going to be cached on the first, on the first method, the index one. And you also have the show, the show action that will handle just one post. But after you have entered it on the index one, all posts will be cached already, so they will be reused on the show action. So the cache is is related to the object itself, so it can be so it can be reused across all different actions and different controllers. So you're just generating the cache once and reusing it across the whole application. Uh, the fourth feature, uh, it's also really cool, and it's actually an improvement from the third one, that it's fragment cache. So, fragment cache works in a way that basically you want to cache part of your response, but you don't want to cache it all. So, let's say, for example, you have this serializer. So, you have title, body, and comments count. But the thing is, the title, you are overriding the attribute you were adding like an interpolation called posts and dash. Then the comments count is also a virtual attribute that you're generating in runtime. But the thing is, if you check those, those methods, uh, the first one doesn't change, so it's definitely cacheable. But the second one changes a lot because it depends on how many comments you get. So you don't want to cache it. So basically what you could do is you can say cache on title or even follow Rails conventions, say cache except comments count, and it will cache only the attributes that we really want. Uh, basically, if you want to use all the cache implementation stuff, this is the most like hard you can get, uh, what is really fun. But all right, I said a lot of those things about performance and cache implementations and whatever. How does IMS compare to, the, to its older versions? So there is this famous phrase, in God we trust, all the others bring data. So I actually brought some data here. So this is the, the benchmark from the 09 version, and this is the benchmark from 010 version. So yeah, we had some great performance increase, but if we use Cached in the 010 version, we can get it even further. So yeah, it's really cool. We have great performance issues that we solved, but there is still a long way to go. We have, we have a lot of other freaking amazing features that I can like spend the whole time speaking about, but I will just go over it for you. So one of them is deserialization, and this feature is really cool. It means that you can receive things in the same convention that you are sending things. So you can also follow JSON API conventions when like receiving a uh, update, updating a, a resource or creating a new resource. Um, this is basically how it would work. You basically could do like post deserialization dot deserialize, and it will deserialize your parameters following the same conventions. So it it will use the same like the same serializer that you have. So you already knows all the attributes that it should accept. Um, all right, let's go over it. So another one, and sorry, this one is in Portuguese. I forgot to translate it. Uh, <laughs> this is basically documentation. So this is really fun because this is another feature. Now that we are doing deserialization, we know how your attributes will go out from an API, and we are doing deserialization, so you know how attributes are going to come in your API. We can basically generate deserialization in one line of code. Uh, and there's a lot of other more. There's fetch mooch, there's pagination, and other and other things. And this whole thing is going to be launching on AMS 010. Actually, we have a uh, released version uh, that is the RC3. So I totally recommend you to check it out. And if you also want to contribute, we have a great team working right now. But if you want to check it out, what is going on and what we have to do, you can also check this blog post called "The Future of AMS" that I wrote on Medium like some a couple months ago probably uh, and we have a list of features that we want to implement that we need to implement before rails 5 release some of them are done already but there's definitely some place to more work there uh, just one more quick thing i want to thank you uh, uh all the team that have been working with me they're really awesome uh uh yeah they really know what they are doing so ams 10 adapter pattern json api cache fragment cache Rails 5, uh, just two disclaimers. So one, I would like to thank you, Ride. Uh, Ride is the company I work on, so they make it possible for me to be in here again, what is awesome. Uh, I'm also writing a book on Elixir. You can check it out on elixirbyrubis.com. 
and I'm gonna probably gonna give another louding talk later about it, so you should check it out. Uh, also check this build new things website. I'm not gonna talk about it right now, and this is it. Thank you. <laughs>